guys can take a seat. I'm so excited to be with you today. Hey, I, um, what I love about so many of our folks is they help keep me on our toes. One of the things that might have been helpful for you was to tell you when our Christmas services are. You might, might want to know that if you're going to invite people to it. So we're really excited. Uh, Christmas will be the first time in the history of Discover Church we're going to run two services. We're excited about that because, yeah, you can clap for that. If you're going to clap, clap. We've heard from so many people that have said, man, I would love to go to service, but I'm, I'm so busy serving. And I've heard a lot of people say, man, we would love to serve, but man, I got to miss out on the service. And so here's the deal. Christmas is going to be a great opportunity. Um, we're going to have two services at nine o'clock and at 1045 on the 23rd. Um, and man, it'd be a great opportunity for you to, you to serve one and then sit one. All right, so would you think about that? You're gonna see some information about that. If you're serving uh, with one of our dream teams, our dream team leaders, hey, if you're not serving anywhere, man, it'd be an awesome opportunity. We are anticipating um, quite a bit more people to come on Christmas. Studies tell us that Christmas is the highest attended Sunday of the year. Um, and so the good news is, is that, that we've got space here um, the bad news is, is we're out of space in the kids, kids area. We're out of space in the parking lot. And so we're going to open up more opportunities and in so doing create opportunities for you guys to serve. So listen, we'd love to get you connected to serving. You'd be willing to, to jump in and help make a difference, help make this Christmas, the Christmas that changes somebody's eternity and the rest of their life, man, we'd love to get you connected to serving. You can go back to the next steps area and get more information about that today. Uh, we're going to conclude our journey through the handbook on how to train an elephant. Uh, this has been an interesting series. It's been a fun series. Um, it's been a pretty remarkable journey as we've taken a survey of our lives um, and seen how different situations and circumstances have a tendency to, to, to really paralyze us and to cause us to feel anchored to our past or anchored to a situation in the present. And what we've learned is, is that the enemy will use different situations and circumstances to prevent us from moving forward into the life that God has for us. We've had some fun along the way. Uh, we've had, we've, we've found ourselves continually as we've studied the life of David, uh, we found ourselves continually in the narrative. Uh, as we've read the story and the account of David and the things that he went through, we have found ourselves in the narrative of the story of the life of David. And it's been pretty profound. It's been pretty heavy. I've heard from many of you that, that the things that we've talked about in this series has, has hit something and touched on something deep in your soul. It has been hurt or wounded or broken. Something that's felt paralyzed. Something that you felt like you were helpless to change or to, to alter in any way. And really the whole gist of, <clears throat> of this whole deal has been about helping us see that there's two forces at work. And in the process of that, it, it's kind of made delivering these messages really interesting. See, for me, when it comes to preaching, uh, uh, when it comes to, to giving a message, giving a talk, giving a sermon, whatever in the world you want to call it, um, it's, a, it's a delicate dance for me because preaching is not about me. Ultimately, I believe that preaching is about God, a holy God, a loving God, who a gracious God who desperately cares for his creation. I believe that preaching is about you, it's about me, it's about us. And it's about a message that God has for a particular group of people in a particular setting at a particular time. And so my job in the preaching process <clears throat> is, is to take a message from God and say, God, what do you want to say to the people who are gonna be here on this Sunday? And my job is to, is to chisel away and chisel away and chisel away all the fluff and all the stuff that isn't necessary and to try to bring the message from God through his word to, the, to us in a way that's clear and it's compelling and, it's, and, it, and it, it allows us to be able to make connections to our lives. And the whole process of preaching is always bathed in much prayer. There's conversation. I've got a, a team that helps me um, process through different information, different messages, different content. And I, I, I just got to be honest with you. There's been no set or series of messages in my 12 years of preaching that I've wrestled with more than I wrestled with this series. And I believe it's because God had intended something specific and God wanted to reach into your heart and into your life and, and to touch something that is broken or wounded and to speak to it so that we can begin to see that what was does not have to be what will be. So that we can begin to see that, that in the midst of, of the chaos and the tragedy and the unforeseen circumstances, that in the midst of all of that, that God is still good. 
that God is still loving and that he is still gracious and that even in the midst of things that are unpleasant, he is still merciful and he still has a plan for our lives. You have to bear with me. I'm struggling on the vocal side of things today. But here's the deal. My hope for you is that this particular message today, as we wrap this series up, I believe that what, what God has intended for us today is the type of message that could, that could change the foundation that we stand on. I believe that what God has for us today through his word is the type of message that could, that could finally break through the barrier in our life. And for the first time, begin to see the light of the sun, S-O-N, in our lives. And to know that there's hope because Jesus is on our side. Today we're gonna to steer away from the life of David. And the reason for that is because what you and I possess, if you belong to Jesus, what you and I possess is something that David couldn't fathom. We have the confidence of the cross of Christ and the empty tomb. And we have the, the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And so for us to fully bring this series to a close, for us to close the book on this series, it's necessary that we, we take a step away from the central figure that we have been looking at throughout this series and we begin to look at some things that are true about us that weren't true about him and how the confidence of Christ, the cross and the empty grave and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, how that changes and rearranges our reality and what it means for me and what it means for you as we move forward. All along this journey, what we've been dealing with is trying to paint a picture to help us to see that there are two opposing forces at work in our lives at all times. Jesus talks about this beautifully in the book of John chapter 10 and verse 10. It says this, that the thief does not come to, except to steal and to kill and destroy. But I, Jesus, have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. You see, what Jesus is trying to help us see is that these two forces are pulling at us in our lives, that they have equally profound and powerful but polar opposite end goals and destinations for our lives. That the enemy, that Satan, he's, he knows that he's going to lose. He knows the end of the story. He knows that his time is limited. So his plan is to steal, kill, and destroy our lives. But Jesus' plan all along has been that we can experience life and life more abundantly. Now, what the problem is, is that we hear that in 21st century America and we get that twisted. You see, the promise is not, Jesus never promises us to have a life of excess. He never promises to have us, to have, for us to have a life of extravagance. What he promises is that we would have a life of abundance. What does that mean? It means that when it comes to the things that we need, which goes far beyond material things, far beyond physical things, but hope and joy and peace and, and, and belief and faith, that our life can, not, can be marked not with a, a small fraction or not with just a little bit or not just enough to get by, but that our lives would be marked as ones of abundance of the things that truly matter. And if it can be burned up, if it can be destroyed, if it can be tossed away, if it can grow old and rust, it doesn't really matter. And so God's desire, Jesus' desire for us is that we can have a life of abundance in the things that truly matter. In order to illustrate this, along the way, we've spent some time talking about um, various things that elephant trainers must do in order to train an elephant to do all types of things that, that you and I, if we were to go to a circus or some type of show, that we would marvel at what these elephants are able to do and, and these big, massive, beastly creatures are able to do these remarkable things. And how is it possible that this massive, massive creature can take orders from such a, in, by comparison, a small and frail being that is its trainer? And what we've learned is that it's the trainer's job to manufacture situations and circumstances to cause the elephant to, to obey. And beyond just obeying, to remove from the elephant's mind 
that there's any other option than to do exactly what the trainer wants it to do in that moment. Because once an elephant believes something, then its actions follow that belief. And once an elephant gets to the point of learning, I am helpless. I can't break free from this chain around my ankle. I can't bust out of this flimsy cage. I can't pull the rope out of my trainer's hand that is around my neck. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. I am helpless, therefore I must obey. You see, here's what the trainer knows. No trainer in their right mind would ever try to capture or train a bull elephant. In fact, we learn in this series that, that the bull elephant is one of very few creatures in all of nature that has no natural predators. I want to show, throw this picture up on the screen. If you were with us at, at the beginning of our series, we threw this picture up on the screen that shows a size comparison of, of, of a man and a woman and, and a full-grown bull elephant. Do we have that? That picture, I believe, yeah, here we go. So here we go, the, in, 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 the, in the blue here, this is a, this is a average size, full grown bull African elephant. Now the one in the pink back there, that's the biggest one that's ever recorded. That's like, he's, he's just Andre the Giant, I guess. But here's the deal, notice the size of, of a man and a woman in comparison to a bull elephant. No trainer in their right mind would ever try to capture that, would ever try to, to manhandle or physically coerce that. I mean, when it stands 16 foot tall and weighs over 10,000 pounds and has a, has a top speed of over 25 miles an hour, I mean, listen, you probably wouldn't blame that elephant trainer if they, instead of trying to train and capture a full grown bull elephant, that maybe just maybe we'll start with the little guy instead. And that's exactly what the trainer will do. You see, the elephant, a full-grown elephant, has already realized its potential of its size and its strength and its mass, and, and that it realizes that there's really nothing that can, that can stand against it. But an immature elephant, a young elephant, a baby elephant, you see, it's yet to realize those things. So as we learn through this series, an elephant trainer will chain them when they're young and teach them that they're powerless to break free from a chain and a stake in the ground. We learn that, that an elephant trainer will make them forget about who they were and what life was like before it was in captivity. An elephant trainer will rip them apart from the, from the herd so that it doesn't have a, a model or an example of what it looks like to be big and strong and powerful and free. An elephant trainer will, will reward obedient behavior as defined by the thing that I want it to do. An elephant trainer will do everything that it can to not let that elephant know its own strength. Will do everything it can to, to prevent it from ever realizing how strong it actually is and the power that it possesses inside of its body. And last, lastly, we learn that an elephant trainer will make them believe that they're the star of the show. Make them believe that everything revolves around them. And as we've gone through this handbook of how to train an elephant, what we've learned is that these things are done by the elephant trader to create the environment where an elephant learns a state of helplessness. And as we've learned that, we have also learned that that's exactly the same thing that the enemy wants to do to us. That the enemy will create and manufacture situations and circumstances or take things in life that are and he will, he will take them and twist them and manipulate them in our lives in such a way that it feels like something has been stolen from us. Like a dream or, or, or a hope or a prayer has been killed. And that everything around me and around my life is just utterly destroyed. And what we've learned is that in our life specifically, the enemy will take things that were said to you, hurtful things by friends and family and loved ones, and will try to use those things to make us believe that what they said about us must be what is true about us. That the enemy will take 
take giants like debt and addiction and broken marriages and relationships and cause us to believe that those things are far too big and we have no hope. That the enemy will take things from our past maybe if we've been victimized and, and cause that, that moment, that, that series of events where we were the victim to play again and again and again and again so that we have such a degraded view of God's perspective of us that we stop listening to God and what he says about us and we only listen to and look to the things that happen to us. And, and we, we get to the point of believing, well, I must be a victim. That must be my story and I'll never break free from it. That the enemy will take your biggest mistakes, your most embarrassing moments, and cause that to feel so close, so closely tied to your identity that whatever, whatever the thing was that you did was so great that it's not possible that God could love you. And we, th we say things like, well, you don't really know me. You don't know my story. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I did. You don't know what I said. God can't possibly love me. We learn that when the enemy will take things like when we receive a tragic diagnosis, when we hear of a sudden loss or a tragic death, and his desire is to cripple us so greatly with, with grief and mourning that we question the very nature of God. And we learn that the enemy will use things like disappointment when we hear no for the thing that we prayed for, hoped for, planned for, and dreamed for. And we'll take that disappointment and whisper into our, our ear that God does not love you. Because if he did, he wouldn't have said no. And so what we've done in this series and, and, and is realizing and connected the dots, how the enemy will take these things to try to chain us and to drag us to a life that can only be categorized that is something must have been stolen from us, something in us or around us must have died or something must have been destroyed. But we've juxtaposed that with the truth of God's word and the reality of the goodness and grace and the mercy of God to help us see that even in the midst of that pain, even in the midst of that darkness, those negative emotions, everything that makes me feel like the world is crashing down around me and, and everything is falling apart, that we have seen by God's word that even in those moments that his strength, his presence, his power, his grace, and his mercy are just as available to us in those moments as they are in the seasons when we're not in those moments. In the same way that the trainer tries to prevent an elephant from fully knowing the strength it possesses, you see, ultimately what the enemy wants to do is to convince you and to distract you and to deter you and to deter me from understanding the strength and the power that we possess in the name of Jesus. You see, Romans 8 puts it like this. Romans 8, verse 11. It says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You, do you understand what this is saying? It's saying that the same power that brought Jesus out of that grave is made available and is accessible to me and to you today if we belong to Jesus. That same power is, is available and accessible to us in every situation and in every circumstance. The problem is, is that in my life, I forget that. I forget that the power that rolled away the stone and breathed life back into Jesus' dead body is the same power that God wants me to have in every day, in every situation, in every circumstance of my life. And so what happens when these situations and circumstances happen, what happens is, is, is we have a, a, a propensity to feel small or weak or puny or insignificant. 
We feel helpless, but listen, here's what we have to understand. We may be small, we may be insignificant, we may be weak and puny and helpless, but we are not hopeless. You are not hopeless. Whatever, whatever the thing is in your life, you are not without hope today. If you've walked into this place feeling like you carry the weight of the world on your shoulders and everything is going to hell in a handbasket, listen to me. All hell may be breaking loose in your life, but that does not mean that you do not have all of heaven and the hope of the resurrected Christ at work and available to us and available to you. I mean, if you're going to clap, clap. You see, this power is made available through the blood of Jesus. It's, it's made uh, apparent to us through his resurrection, and it's accessible to us through the Holy Spirit. The power that you possess inside of you by the Holy Spirit, the enemy can't argue with. He can't compete with. He can't overwhelm you. He can't overpower you. In the same way that an elephant trainer can't overwhelm a bull elephant, what does he do instead? No, he tries to find the weak ones and, and, and the ones that are in seasons of their life where they aren't strong and they're not at full size and they've not yet reached their potential. And the enemy will try to manipulate and coerce and to, to, to get it to believe and to think a certain way. And that's exactly what the enemy does in your life and mine. He knows he can't overpower us, and so instead, he tries to outmaneuver us. He tries to use these situations and to speak false truths into those situations and into our hearts and into our lives to cause us to not believe and to question who God is, even in the midst of all of this. You see, something has happened for so many of us that we have been lied to and led to believe that, it, that if I've got Jesus, then everything is always gonna be sunshine and rainbows. That's not true. That's not the hope of Jesus. Here is the hope of Jesus. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned because he is with us. That is the hope of Jesus. Life is going to be hard, but with Jesus I have hope. Life is going to destroy you at times, but with Jesus, I have hope. Things are going to happen that are going to completely deteriorate and disable and destroy my perspective and my view on life and my hope in, in a situation. But in Jesus, I still have hope. Give me Jesus and I'll be okay. So in those moments, when we understand this, we have to stop seeing ourselves as small, as weak, as puny, as helpless. We have to stop seeing ourselves as creatures and beings that are constantly being drugged around by life, where life constantly happens to me and that I never have any control. We have to stop being people that continue to, to, to allow when life happens to stop adopting a posture and a message that go, well, here we go again. Woe is me. The man keeping me down. I'll never get ahead. No. We have to understand that in Christ, that is not who we are. We are not small and puny and helpless, not because that we, we are, are big and massive and powerful, but because in Christ and the Holy Spirit, all of the power of God is in us. That God wants to, in the midst of whatever terrible thing may happen, God wants you to see, I know this hurts. I know this stinks. I know this knocked the wind out of your sails, but I got you. And if you would just have a little bit of faith in me, then you would see the incredible things that God can do with just a little bit of faith. We have to start realizing that the power of the Spirit of God is, is alive and at work within you. The situation, the circumstance may have the authority and the power to change what you see. It may have the power to change the condition of your surrounding, but we as followers of Jesus should never allow ourselves to get to the point where a situation or circumstances alters my faith in the son of the living God. And that recognizing that we may not be able to change the condition 
of our surroundings, but the condition of my faith is immovable and rock solid. And that my confidence is found not in me, not in my ability, not in my, my will, not in my determination, not in my grit, that my confidence comes in the resurrected Christ. And when we have that confidence, when we start to have that attitude, then it changes the way that we look at the world. That when we see the storm clouds of life start to brew and, and, and billow up all around us, and when, when the lightning begins to, to flash and strike and thunderings begin to shake the ground that we walk on, that we recognize that as people of God, as followers of Jesus, as one who has been bought by the blood of Christ, that I do not have to cede the ground that he has fought and won for me, that I can stand on this ground because he fought for it, he delivered it, he gave it to me, and I can declare to the storm, bring your worst because I'm gonna bring mine with the authority of God behind me, and you may be able to knock me down but you'll never be able to knock me out. I shared with you at the beginning of this series that there's two profound things that we need to activate in our lives in order to make sure that we don't get stuck in the stuff of life. That when the stuff of life, the, the, the things that happen that we can't control, when they happen, that we can absorb the blow, but we never get chained and shackled to the place in the moment. And those two things are this. Number one, we have to activate the power of faith. I've spent a lot of time talking about that throughout this series, that we have to have faith in who God is and faith in what God has said and that, 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 that what God said doesn't get to, 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 to be thwarted or overwhelmed by what the world says, what the enemy says. We spent a lot of time talking about faith. But what I want to help you see in the last little bit of time we have together today is the second very critical and essential thing that you and I have to activate in our lives in those moments so that we don't get stuck you're going to feel it. You're going to feel the blow. It's going to happen. It might knock the wind out of your sails and lock your legs out from underneath you, but you don't have to be stuck in it. And you and I have to activate the power of perspective. The power of perspective. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4 has this really interesting verse. And this is just about half of it. But it says this, that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I'm sorry, you, you didn't hear what I just said because if you heard it or understood it, then, 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 then you would have been a little bit excited about what that means for us because what it said is, is that he who is in us, that's Jesus, he who is in us, Jesus, the spirit of God, the presence of God, available and accessible in my life at the moment of salvation, the third person of the Trinity of God come and took residence in my soul that greater is he that is in us than he, that's the enemy, that's Satan, than he that is in the world. I mean, come on. You see, what happens when we understand that is we have, to, we have to begin to understand and we have to begin to proclaim and preach to ourselves in those moments that when I believe that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, then, then I begin to recognize that I need to put it in perspective. Say that with me. Put it in perspective. What is it? Well, it for me is different than it for you. There's all kinds of things that happen in life. I want to help you understand what this verse means and help you see how to activate it and how it can propel us out of the rut that we find ourselves in. You see, the reason why all of these things that we've been talking about in this series seem so big and so powerful and so overwhelming is because of the proximity that we have to it. Whatever it is. That when it shows up, it shows up, boom, it's right in your face, it's right in your life, and it seems huge, and it seems massive, and it seems so much more powerful than you are or than I am. You see, in that moment when it shows up, death, debt, addiction, pornography, 
broken relationship, disappointment, injustice, when it shows up, it's so big and it's so strong because it's so close. In your chair, when you sat down or in the chair next to you, you found a postcard. I want you to grab that postcard. The postcard says it. We're really creative around here. It. I want, you, I want you to pick it up. And I want to ask you, what is it in your life? What is it that has showed up in your life that has caused you to be stuck? What is it that has showed up that has caused you to feel helpless? What is it that has presented itself in, in your life? Maybe it was something in the past that you, you've not really fully dealt with that you're still feeling the weight of, 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 of it. That it feels like a noose around your neck. That if you're being honest with yourself and be honest with God, that you know that you're not living an abundant life. You're not experiencing an abundant life because of it. What is it? Perhaps you'd be so bold if you have a pen that you would write down what it is. You would give it a name. Whatever it is, the enemy will use it to make you believe you're helpless. The enemy will do everything that he can to convince you that you are powerless to change it. The enemy will constantly put it in your face. He will constantly make sure that it feels so close and so near that it feels like a straitjacket. And then maybe you've done it in your own effort and your own energy to try to get out of it, to fight your way through it, to self-will and self-determine that I will get through it. But you see, the, the text doesn't say as greater is you that is in you than he that is in the world. No, the text says as greater that is he that is in you. You see, the problem with trying to do it on our own, the problem with, with doing it in our own self-will and our own self-determination is that you are small and weak and puny and powerless against it unless you have him in your life. I want you to look at the screen. On the screen, we've put Jesus on there as big as we possibly could. From where you sit, that seems pretty small. From where you sit, as you wrestle with it, Jesus will oftentimes feel so distant and so far. And because it feels so close and Jesus seems so far, it begins to feel like it's bigger than your Jesus. I want you to do this, take your postcard, put it in front of your face like this. Everybody everywhere, take your postcard and put it in front of your face. Put it right in front of your eyes so that you can't see me, you can't see the person next to you. Make sure it is facing you, staring you right in the eyeballs. In this moment, I want you to name it in your mind. What is it? What is it that is staring you down? What is it that is intimidating you? What is it that seems so strong and so powerful and so prevailing and so overwhelming that you can't see past it, you can't see around it, you can't see over it, and you can't see through it because it is so big. See, here's what I want you to see. You can put them down for a second. You see, here's what I want to help you see. The only way that you will ever get beyond it is when you do two things. You have to get your eyes off of it and get your eyes onto Jesus. 
You see, when our eyes are on it, we can't see what's happening around us. We can't even see that Jesus is up here in massive, overwhelming, dominating presence. You see, the enemy will put it so close and make it so, so near to you that you can't see beyond it. You can't even see Jesus. If Jesus were to walk in front of you, you would miss him. You have to get your eyes off of it and on to Jesus. How do we do that? Then you, you, we do that by serving somebody. Can I tell you, it's really hard to be focused on it when you are focusing on them. God has given you gifts and abilities and talents and resources that God wants to use so that you can begin to see how big Jesus is, not just around you, not just in you, but how big Jesus can be through you. As a church, we're passionate about helping you discover your purpose. Listen, we wanna help you get connected and to serve, not because we need you to serve. Listen, I've got this promise in my back pocket. When Jesus started the church, he said, hey, y'all just need to know this one thing, that I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. I don't need you. I'm inviting you, but I don't need you. So when I step in to use what God has given me to serve him and serve others and to serve the church, it's not so that I can walk around and feel really good about myself. It's so that I can walk away knowing that I have been used by a holy God who spoke creation into existence, who knit me together when I was in my mother's womb. And that God who saw me at my worst sent his son Jesus to die for me, to redeem me, to ransom me, to clean me up and to set me on a new course heading. And that God whom I don't even deserve to speak his name in a breath has invited me with him to do what he has had been doing since the beginning of time. And I walk away from serving with confidence and and with grace and with joy knowing, wow, that God who should have despised me because of who I was, loves me enough to make me new and then to invite me into what he's doing. Oh my word. We get our eyes off of Jesus by, by getting connected in community. So that when it gets really big in my life, there are some people who don't have it, my it in front of them. You gotta be careful how I'm saying this now because it starts to run together and sounds really bad in the house of the Lord. But my it doesn't get in front of them. And so, so that they can see around and beyond and, and through what I can't see. And so community says, hey, listen, I know it's bad, but it's not hopeless. Let me help you see what Jesus has been doing in you, through you, around you, that you haven't been able to see because of it has been so close. We get our eyes off of Jesus when we begin to model generosity through our financial and physical resources. First to the church and then, and then elsewhere. Again, same thing. He doesn't need our money. Can I tell you something? The church doesn't need your money. You need to experience God at work when you're willing to trust him with your money. We get our eyes off of Jesus. When we start saying yes to him and obedience and allowing him to change us one step at a time, that we step away from the things that he says are wrong and take steps towards the things that he says are good and righteous and holy. See, we've got to get our eyes off of it and we've got to get our eyes on Jesus. The second thing that we have to do <clears throat> is we have to continually pursue Jesus. You see, when we continually pursue Jesus, it's the same steps. How do we get our eyes off of Jesus? Through serving, through generosity, through community, through, through growing in our faith, through telling people our story. Those are the same things that we do to pursue Jesus so that we can get closer to him. And listen, I'm just gonna tell you something because what I'm getting ready to tell you is gonna, it's gonna change somebody's world. It's gonna, break, it's gonna break through something that has been built up for a long time in your life. Because what I told you, when you held that card in front of your face, you can't see Jesus because of it. I want you to put that card in front of your face one more time. One more time. And I want you to see what happens. <laughs> After we get our eyes off of it and we get our eyes onto Jesus and we start pursuing Jesus, this is what happens. Can I have your card? Let me have your card. Awesome, you can look at me real quick. You see what happens? When we, when we back away from it, 
and we start to get closer to Jesus, then it starts to get smaller and Jesus starts to get a little bit bigger. <laughs> Y'all didn't hear me. Because when I get a little bit closer to Jesus, it starts to feel a little bit less significant. It starts to feel a little bit less powerful. It starts to feel a little bit less intimidating. Y'all aren't hearing me. Because when I get closer to Jesus and I put it in perspective of who my Jesus is, then it can't have power over me. Why? Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Listen, I'm just telling you, if you're here today and you've experienced the power of God and you've experienced putting things in the proper perspective and you're, you've seen Jesus at work and that Jesus has at times or even now feels so much bigger than it because you have finally put it in its proper place and told the enemy the same thing that Jesus told the enemy when the enemy tried to convince him you don't have to go to that cross, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And somebody needs to stand up. We're going to stand up and we're going to shout and we're going to sing. If you've experienced that, if you know that goodness, if you've experienced that grace, then would you stand and would you sing and would you proclaim how good our God is, how he's so much bigger than it. It doesn't matter what it is. I don't have to know what it is. You know what it is. But most importantly, you know how big Jesus is. Man, would you sing?